Good morning. We are going to get into a subject that's always been my favorite, and this is the character of God. I've entitled this talk, Is God Just? Is God just? Can you prove it? If someone comes to you and says, can you prove to me God is just? Where's the justice in God killing 186,000 here and 70,000 here and killing Uzzah? And they can go right through the scriptures. Can you show me that God is just? We need to be able to prove that. And I think this was touching on it, although I'm sure there's much more that we can learn. 1 John 4.16 tells us that God is love. It was this love that Christ came to impart to the world. And we read an interesting statement in 4.15 of Christ's object lessons. It is the darkness of misapprehension of God that is enshrouding the world. Men are losing their knowledge of his character. It has been misunderstood and misinterpreted. At this time, a message from God is to be proclaimed, a message illuminating in its influence and saving in its power. His character is to be made known. Into the darkness of the world is to be shed the light of his glory, the light of his goodness, mercy, and truth. The last message to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of love. Now, this is the last message, see. And uh, I don't think we as a church have arrived at that point yet. We're just starting to get a greater glimpse of the love of God as we study these particular subjects. We're told that the whole spiritual life is molded by our conception of God. And if we cherish erroneous views of his character, our souls will sustain injury. This is the manuscript 146, 1902. The love of God is a crucial aspect of our gospel, which the spirit of prophecy terms the last message. This last message is a revelation of the love of God, which we believe is necessary for full character development, because love is the only agency that God uses to expel sin from our lives. Question. What statement would you believe is correct? When the gospel shall go to all the world, as Matthew 24 indicates, then shall the end come. Or... He will come, as our statement says in Christ's Object Lesson 69, when the character of God shall be perfectly reproduced in our lives, then he will come. Correct. In other words, unless the gospel accomplishes what it was intended to do, Christ would never return. And his gospel is to recreate us. We've been looking at the redemptive power of the Sabbath and the gospel message all week long. The power of God unto salvation to save us from sin. So these things go hand in hand. This gospel shall be preached in all the world for a what? There's the witness right there. For a witness. But to answer the question, is God just, would you say that our own justice system is fair? No. In fact, I have the answer being no. Why not? It's arbitrary. The laws of the land follow society. Society is not contained by laws. Laws of men are constantly changing, always evolving. Men's laws are an arbitrary system. This is what makes our system unjust. If an individual were to go before, say, four judges on any given day for sentencing, and within certain parameters of law, and depending on how the judges feel that particular day, one may have had a fight with his wife, the other celebrating his birthday or something, they would probably render four different sentences within certain parameters of law. We have a superior court judge in our family, and I asked him this. And I said, is our court system fair? And he goes, hmm, not really. And he says, it's arbitrary. I have to admit it's arbitrary. We do the best we can. But he says, I want you to know that every judge has their little pet peeve. There's a particular transgression that he'll really throw the book at you for if you come before him. You may have stolen a car, and this one particular judge is not that concerned about it, and he'll be lenient. But if you commit another particular crime that he is really bent on dealing out punishment, that day you've gotten the wrong judge. And so it is possible to render these various different decisions. There's always deal-makings and going so forth and so on. In order for God to be just, then, God would have to be what? Not arbitrary. He would have to be free from all forms of arbitrariness. And he does so by revealing that the punishment for sin is inherent within sin itself and that the punishment actually fits the crime, unlike our system. When punishments are externally imposed upon sin, as they necessarily are in any human system of justice, the punishment is inescapably arbitrary, however just it may be. But when the punishment emerges internally and unavoidably from sin itself, then the punishment is free from all arbitrariness. Such justice, though severe, would be obviously and verifiably just and fair, in my thinking. Now, I'm just going to offer this to you, and you could do what you want with it. Uh, I've been wrestling with this for 30 years, and I said there must be a way of proving God's justice. 
Sin isn't death because God says it is, but rather by its very nature. The intrinsic nature of sin is such that it's unchanging or immutable as the law of gravity, and God cannot and will not alter that fact. Sin is death, and we've been talking about that all week long. That is a reality. Desire of Ages 764, we find a very interesting statement. By a life of rebellion, Satan and all who united with him place themselves so out of harmony with God that his very presence is to them a consuming fire. The Bible tells us God is a consuming fire to sin. The glory of him who is love will destroy them. The glory of him who is love will destroy him. At the beginning of the great controversy, the angels did not understand this. Had Satan and his host then been left to reap the full result of their sin, they would have perished, the full result of their sin. But it would not have been apparent to heavenly beings that this was the inevitable result of sin. They would have perceived that this punishment was coming from God, because this is the first time they're seeing what sin is all about. They don't understand how it works and the science of it. But listen to how she closes this. At the end of a thousand years, when sin has manifested its nature then the extermination of sin will vindicate God's love. Now that is an interesting statement. Will vindicate his love. This is not an act of arbitrary power on the part of God. Now I want to introduce you to a statement that you're probably familiar with. This statement is found in early writings, page 294. Talking about the second death, Sister White wrote this. Satan rushes into the midst of his followers and tries to stir up the multitude to action. But fire from God out of heaven is rained upon them, and the great men and the mighty men, the noble, poor, and miserable, are all consumed together. I saw that some were quickly destroyed, while others suffered longer. They were punished according to the deeds done in the body, and some were many days being consumed. And as long as there was one portion of them unconsumed, all the sense of suffering remained. So she's saying that as long as there is one ounce of flesh left to prey upon, the sense of suffering remained. When I read this 30 years ago, I thought, what have I gotten myself into? This is Baptist theology. I couldn't believe it. I said, is this possible? You have a fire that's two, 3,000 degree Fahrenheit, and you have people for many days burning in this thing, and as long as my fingernail is not consumed, the sense of suffering remains? This just was not making sense to me. But I thank God she puts this next text in. The worm of life shall not die, their fire shall not be quenched, as long as there is the least particle for it to prey upon. So I said, the worm of life, what is the worm of life? I need to do a study on the worm of life. So that's what I started to do. In Revelation 29, it says, And they went up on the breath of the earth and encompassed the camp about the saints of the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Said the angel, the worm of life shall not die, their fire shall not be quenched, as long as there is the least particle for it to prey upon. Satan and his angels suffered long. Satan bore not only the weight and punishment of his own sins, but also of the sins of the redeemed host, which had been placed upon him, and he must also suffer for the ruin of souls which he had caused. So he's going to get the bigger portion of the pie. If I didn't come back on the Day of Atonement, that would tell God that I've changed my mind. I no longer care what he does about that sin. I don't, it doesn't particularly bother me if he doesn't blot it out. I'm forever cut off from the house of Israel, the Bible says. So my sins are not atoned for. And those sins are picked up during that service. And they're placed on the escape goat. So Satan's going to have to suffer for his sins, for the sins of the wicked, and also for the redeemed. Because all the sins that have been placed there by the redeemed, they're going to go onto the escape goat. So he's got quite a handful at the end of time. How is it possible that one could burn many days physically? Is it possible? I remember reading an article about the uh, Pompeii, uh, the uh, Mount Vesuvius, when it blew. They said it was a 500 degree centigrade and a little higher. Because of that heat, these people died within two hundredths of a second and their skulls exploded. I said, well, how is it possible that you can burn many, many days in a fire? To me, logically, that's not possible. The only way it is possible, and I don't even want to go there, but I'll share it with you, it's satanic. A loving God would have to intervene and prevent physical laws from doing their natural work. So he wants to torture these people as long as he can. I can't even go down that road. So when I read a statement like this, there must be a solution to it, and we're going to pursue that. So I started studying the Bible about fire, and I found that Jeremiah 23:29 tells us that God's word is a fire. Is that physical or spiritual? Spiritual. 
1 Samuel 15:11, when God came to Samuel concerning Saul's apostasy, the Bible says, he wept and grieved bitterly all night long. Now that word grieve is the word for fire or mental torment. Physical, spiritual. See, it's spiritual. Jeremiah and Ezekiel, another fire is introduced, talking about men and women who, brutish is the word, a display for anger, which is the word for fire in that particular sense. So a physical display of anger is referred to as a fire, anger. And, of course, then we have our literal fire. So I found three spiritual fires, and, of course, we have the literal fire. There are three spiritual fires, one physical. Question, if Christ died the same death, that the wicked will die at the end of a thousand years, which we're going to verify, where is the fire on the cross? Or was there? There was. But what killed him? The sins of the world, he died of a broken heart. He died of mental anguish. That's one of our spiritual fires. To better understand the answer to this question, it would be wise to pause and investigate the cross. Isaiah 53.10, Matthew 26.38 tells us that he made his mind a sacrifice for sin. This is demonstrated in the word Gethsemane. The word Gethsemane means an olive press. You throw olives into this press, the big rock crushes the olive, and the oil flows out to the bottom of the olive press. Well, Christ stated that he was the green olive. He walked into the Garden of Gethsemane, this olive press, and the sins of the world, symbol of a rock, began to crush the Holy Spirit and the oil out of his life. So the, the very meaning of the word was demonstrating what was taking place spiritually in his life at that time. The sins were crushing his life. He began to sweat drops of blood. and He staggered under the tremendous guilt of sin as he went to Calvary. See, now here comes this guilt. This horror of great darkness is coming upon him. Remember, he's done for our sins. So he says, I'm going to take your sins and I'm going to pay the penalty for that. So that means this veil is going to be removed and he's going to see our sins in all their horrific horror. This is what was killing our Savior. It was not the spear thrust. It was not the pain of the cross that caused the death of Jesus. His heart was broken by mental anguish. He was slain by the sins of the world. This is why we read in Bible Commentary 7a, the sword of justice was unsheathed and the wrath of God rested against man's substitute, Jesus Christ, the only begotten of the Father. So this statement tells us that the wrath of God rested on Christ. Now, some people interpret the wrath of God as God stepping out of character and he's just lost it for a moment and he's clobbering people and killing them. God is not a psychopath who loses it. In the human nature of the Son of God staggered under the terrible horror of the guilt of sin, he bore the wrath of God for a sinful world. And that statement tells you what the wrath of God is. You know, God's wrath comes to us in three severities. The least severe is through captivity. And we find that in Jeremiah 27 and 8. Another one would have been Manasseh. Remember, he was taken off into captivity. And God basically says, okay, I'm going to visit your iniquity upon you, and I'm going to send you into captivity. Now, if you don't want to go into captivity, then I'm going to send sword, famine, and pestilence. That would be the second severity of the wrath of God. And ultimately, the most severe form of the wrath of God, and there's no turning back from this, is demonstrated on the cross itself. And it was shown to be a terrible realization of the enormity of sin. As perceived through the eyes of sin itself, the experience of God's punishment is thus the experience of realization Wrath comes in the form of awareness, the awareness of the horror and depth of sin, and awareness that sin itself enforces with fearful terror. This was the punishment for our sins that Christ endured. Lamentations 3.2 says, He hath led me and brought me into darkness. This is the darkness that Christ was experiencing. He was led into this darkness because of the sin. And sin is the word for guilt. So when I ask people, what is the destructive power of sin? The destructive power is guilt. This is what God spares us from. We are under solemn obligation to retain our conscience of sin, but that's diminished to a great degree or we wouldn't be able to live with ourselves by the mercy of God. So when you look at texts like Romans 4.15, because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. See, the law worketh sin for those that don't obey it. Romans 2.5, you treasure up unto thyself sin against the day of wrath. You store up wrath for the day of wrath. Well, when is the day of wrath? It comes at the end of a thousand years. That's the lake of fire. So you're heaping up more and more sin or guilt for the day of sin and guilt. This is why God told the Levites to lay those people to sleep that built the golden calf who rejected his mercy. They closed their probation and he said, I'm going to lay you to sleep because if you live, you will just heap up more and more wrath for the day of wrath. God said, I'm not going to put you through that. 
Mount of Blessings 116 says, If we had to bear our own sin, they would crush us. Our sins would crush us. The same way they killed Christ on the cross. Why is it called God's wrath? Because he took our sin or our wrath upon himself as if it were his. 2 Corinthians 5.2 says, He became sin for us who knew no sin. We shall be saved from wrath or sin and guilt through Christ. He took that punishment. He took our sins upon him. It becomes his. Christ identified so closely with sinners that he speaks of our sins as if they were his. So that you can speak of his righteousness in your life as if it is yours. So whenever the term wrath of God appears in the Bible, you must understand that wrath comes from sinners, not from God. But the fact that he suffered it, he says it is his. Job 21.19 tells us, God layeth up his iniquity for his children. Now, is God a sinner? Of course not. Whose iniquity is he laying up? Ours. He paid the penalty for it. Verse 20 says, His eyes shall see his destruction, and he shall drink of the wrath of the Almighty. Now, the sanctuary clearly teaches that if you didn't come back on the Day of Atonement, your sins were given back to you. There's a day of visitation. Turn with me to Jeremiah 14.10. Thus saith the Lord unto his people, Thus have they loved to wander. They have not refrained their feet, meaning a life not in harmony with God. Therefore the Lord does not accept them. He will now remember their iniquity and visit their sins. He's going to visit their sins. In verse 16, For I will pour their wickedness upon them. Whose wickedness is it? Their own. Back up to verse 12, their wickedness came in the form of what? Sword, famine, and pestilence. Zephaniah 1, 14, 15 reads, The great day of the Lord is near and hasteth greatly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. I can testify for that because that's exactly what I experienced in my mind. Nahum 1.2 states, He reserveth wrath for his enemies. The righteous are promised in Romans 5.9, We shall be saved from wrath through him. So we're saved from our sins, but the enemies of God will not be. Their sins will come back upon them. So what was his suffering? Desire of Ages 7.53, it tells us, It was the sense of the enormity of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him. To better understand the statement about the fire in early writings, page 294, we need to take a look at the word worm because it says their worm shall not die. A quenchless fire, it shall consume soul and body. Isaiah 26. Worm in, in the Hebrew language means to rise up or ex, to exalt oneself, which is sin. It means a maggot, the crimson grub. It's red. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. A worm is a symbol of sin and the destructive power of sin is guilt. It is God by way of the veil, Christ, that shields us from this guilt. Psalm 22, 6, But I am a worm and no man, David declared. He says, Blessed is the man whose sins are blotted out. He was being tortured and tormented by his awareness of sinfulness. And he says, I am no man but a worm. Christ was saturated with worms. He took all of our guilt of the entire race upon him. In King Herod's example, in Acts 12.23, remember it said that the moment Herod stepped up and received praise and homage offered him from the people, what happened to him? The angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory, and he was eaten of what? Worms. And he gave up the ghost. Now, secular history tells us that he was infested with maggots in his growing area. But when you read the account of Spirit of Prophecy, she doesn't mention that. She talks about a spiritual worm of life, the worm of life that shall not die. Listen to what she says here. Herod knew that he deserved none of the praise and homage offered him. Yet he accepted it. The people said, it is the voice of a god and not of man. But suddenly something terrible happened to him. His face became pallid as death and distorted with agony because the angel of the Lord just smote him with worms. All of a sudden now his whole demeanor, his countenance changes. Great drops of sweat dropped from his pores. He stood for a moment as if transfixed with pain and terror. Then turning his blanched and livid face to his horror-stricken friends, he cried in hollow, despairing tones, He whom ye have exalted as a god is stricken with death. At that very instant he knew he was going to die. It was that sudden. Remorse seized him. He remembered his relentless persecution of the followers of Christ. He remembered his cruel command to slay the innocent James and his design to put to death the apostle Peter. He felt that God was now dealing with him, the relentless persecutor. He found no relief from his pain or body or anguish of mind, and he expected none. 
Herod was acquainted with the law of God, which says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And when he crucified Christ, he knew he was the Son of God. Ellen White makes that very clear. Now, the same angel that had come from the royal courts to rescue Peter had been the messenger of wrath and judgment to Herod. The angel smote Peter to arouse him from slumber. It was with a different stroke that he smote the wicked king. And Herod died a great agony of mind and body under the retributive judgment of God. He goes on to say right here, He was in constant fear that John would avenge his death by passing condemnation upon him and his house. Herod was reaping that which God had declared to be the result of a course of sin, a trembling heart and failing of eyes and sorrow of mind. And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night, and shall have none assurance of thy life. This is the same thing that Pilate went through. His wife said, had nothing to do with this man. And Pilate died just riddled with guilt, she says. A horrible death of guilt and despair. The sinner's own thoughts are his accusers. And there can be no torture keener than the sting of a guilty conscience, which gives him no rest day or night. That's in the Tsar of Ages 223. His own conscience is his worst accuser. No rest day or night, no torture worse than the sting of a guilty conscience. And the sting of death is sin. Well, the sting represents guilt. This is what God bails us from. Education 144, against every evildoer, God's law utters condemnation. He may disregard that voice. He may seek to drown its warning, but in vain it follows him. It makes itself heard. It destroys his peace. If unheeded, it pursues him to the grave. It bears witness against him at the judgment, a quenchless fire. It consumes at last soul and body. I conclude that this is a spiritual fire which is nothing more than guilt and despair brought about by the day of visitation. The wicked is reserved to the day of destruction. They shall be brought forth to the day of wrath. And the day of wrath is when the sins are given back to them. So what happens at the end of the thousand years? You have God and his saints returning home in this beautiful temple. He resurrects all the wicked. He resurrects this entire army. Satan is turned loose. They build implements of war. You can read about this in Spirit of Prophecy. So how long does that take? And now they're getting ready to march across this broken ground to the city. And as they get there, the Bible simply says, fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. Now, if you were to just read that statement and take it for what it says, it sounds to me like sin has nothing to do with their final demise, when in fact it has everything to do with their demise. So I'm saying, what is this fire that God is throwing down on them? Patriarchs and prophets, when the records of heaven shall be opened, and the people are standing arrayed outside the city, the judge will not in words declare to man his guilt, but will cast one penetrating, convicting glance, and every deed, every transaction of life will be vividly impressed upon the memory of the wrongdoer. All of a sudden, he stops them dead in their tracks because their guilt comes upon them, and they are paralyzed with fear. And I can attest to that. You are totally incapacitated. You can do nothing. Great Controversy 666, as soon as the books of record are open and the eye of Jesus looks upon the wicked, they are conscious of every sin which they have ever committed. Each actor recalls the part which he performed. All behold the enormity of their guilt. Proverbs 522, his own iniquity shall take the wicked himself and he shall be holden with the cords of his sin. Psalm 68, 2, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. God is a consuming fire to sin. So what's happening here? God's people have made provisions to have this veil removed. These people have not made provisions to have that veil removed. So when God finally steps out from between the Father, now the justice of reality goes right to work. The worm of life that shall not die, a quenchless fire, is going to eat and eat and prey upon him. And I've heard that statement so many times, unfortunately. When growing up as a kid, I had two childhood friends that took their own life. And I do remember them saying, boy, this guilt is just eating me alive. Thinking back on that, I said, wow, a worm of life that shall not die, a quenchless fire, it consumes. You can't live with yourself. You become suicidal. It is a reality that any unconquered condition of sinfulness has the potential of inflicting the death of irreversible hopelessness when confronted with the glory of God. The heathen are sunk down in the pit that they made, and the net which they hid is their own foot taken. The Lord is known by the judgment that he executeth. The wicked is ensnared in the work of his own hands. See, unlike the 144,000 who travailed to give birth, a birth that frees them from sin, the wicked travailed to give birth to a character, a birth that forever holds them in sin and captive and ultimately destroys them. Ezekiel 28:18. Let's turn there, everyone, because this is our key text. Would somebody like to read that for me? 
Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of it. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from where? From the midst. In Hebrew it means out of or within you. So where does this fire start? Inside. Where was the fire with Samuel? Mental torment. Where was the fire with Christ? Mental torment. It's a spiritual fire, this worm of life, this guilt from sin. This fire starts from within. Now, I want to be very clear about this. I am not excluding a literal fire. But I'm saying there are two fires going to occur at the end of time, and I believe the spiritual fire takes place first. The veil is being lifted, and they haven't made provisions for it. Although Christ made provisions to have the veil lifted in his life, that experience known as the horror of great darkness almost destroyed him. But we read in Desire of Ages, amid the awful darkness apparently forsaken of God, Christ drained the last dregs of the cup of human woe. Whose cup did he drink? Ours. It was a cup of iniquity. He drank it. And he felt this separation from his father. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What was God's attitude towards his son at that time? God suffered with his son. The Bible says he was smitten and afflicted of his father. The wrath of God rested upon man's substitute. Well, if you interpret the wrath of God as God getting angry, then God killed his son in anger. I, I can't go there either. But God suffered with his son. Angels beheld the Savior's agony. They saw the Lord enclosed by legions of satanic forces. His nature weighed down with a shuddering, mysterious dread. There was silence in heaven. What was Christ's attitude toward the Pharisees? He never went out of his way to embarrass them in any way. He tried to reach them until they had closed their own probation. Then he gave them a public rebuke. So as we look at the 144,000, we find that they too will have made provision to have this veil removed. But unfortunately, the wicked have not. The wicked have not made provision to have this veil removed, and such a one is vulnerable indeed when confronted in the judgment with the law of God. He sees as never before his wretchedness. His counterfeit source of acceptance is stripped from him. Just like the counterfeit source of salvation is stripped from these people during the Sunday laws, it's going to be stripped from all the wicked down at the end of time. But he has nothing true to put in its place. Now his blindness becomes his avenging enemy. With a profound sense of guilt, he can see no love or mercy reaching down to him. He has not educated himself to see these things in times of peace, and now the blackening blindness of his sin makes them all the more remote from his darkened sight. As terror seizes them, their very terror becomes conclusive evidence to them that God has forever forsaken them. Thus, their terror feeds on itself, carrying them down in a vicious circle of condemnation and despair. Within such terror, faith becomes absolutely impossible. The blindness acquired in prosperity now becomes irreversible, forever keeping God's love and mercy beyond sight and therefore beyond reach. The sinner can receive no life for grace from God because these can be received only through a clear-eyed perception of unwavering faith. Thus, through blindness, he is as lost as his despair says he is. His despair becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. I will bring distress upon men that they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord. Zephaniah 117. In conclusion, I would say God's retribution is nothing more than the outworking of a function of law, a law that Christ himself was powerless to circumvent on the cross. This is exactly what's happening to them. It is in the form of cruel despair that sin, once so congenial, assumes its greatest power and imposes its fiercest temptations. For 6,000 years, God has veiled the destructive power of sin by way of his Son in the veil, Christ. When it does come, it comes in the form of guilt and despair, mental anguish. It is a spiritual fire which in many respects is more cruel and just as destructive as a literal one. Isaiah 24:22, And they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit, and they shall be shut up in the prison, and after many days they shall be visited. And that was their day of visitation. The sins are given back to them. Great Controversy 6.72, it talks about Satan rushes into the midst of his subjects. Now this is where Ellen White left off in early writings. She says Satan rushes into the midst of his subjects, and he endeavors to inspire them with his own fury and arouse them to instant battle. See, because they're paralyzed now. They're stopped dead in their track. Their rage is kindled against Satan and those who have been his agents in deception, and with the fury of demons, they turn upon one another. If you have 25 billion people with a fury of demons and they made implements of war, how many people do you think got killed in that little skirmish? So if you just believe in a literal fire only, I would say to you that not everybody's going to die in that fire.
Because this battle here will take a good number of them. So we're trying to make sense of all of this. Says the Lord, because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God, behold, therefore I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against thee. Every battle of the warrior is confused noise, and garments are rolled in blood. So this is a bloodbath that's taking place here. I believe that they, these wicked people, like Christ, will cry out, My God, my God, don't leave us out here to die. Now they want to be saved. They see the beautiful city. They see that they've been warring against the wrong individual. What could God say to these people? I didn't. I gave you my son. So is God going to die in vain? Unfortunately, he will. For many. For billions. This form of justice reveals the love of God, his character. Knowing that God would never subject anyone to this kind of punishment without first taking it upon himself on the cross. Boy, what a love. Thus, he made a way of escape for those who avail themselves of Christ paying that severe penalty. This justice is not an arbitrary system. They are reaping only which they have sown, and the punishment actually fits the crime, unlike our penal system. So whatever you sow, you reap. Some are consumed instantly. Some are many days being consumed. Satan and his hosts suffer the longest because they're reaping what they've sown, being punished. It's all going to be worked out in the deeds of their body. God's Amazing Grace 168. Christ was suffering the death that was pronounced upon the transgressors of his law. How clear is that? He's suffering the death that they're going to die. Well, what death did he die? Mental anguish. The sins of the world. So I want to be very clear before we close here. Apart from the spiritual fire, I believe that there will indeed be a physical fire, as the Bible indicates. But I do believe that the Bible clearly teaches a day of visitation. And we've made that very clear, I hope, and have well documented it. A day when the sins of the wicked are given back to them, igniting a spiritual fire from within, which comes first. This is a fire that is too often overlooked or rarely discussed. Rarely discussed. I believe that when the physical fire does come, it will be a mercy killing. Because they will be consumed like that in that type of fire. So I'm just trying to share with you what I believe to help us to understand what the love of God is all about. God would never take that type of attitude I had an individual tell me one time that God will rejoice in it and he will hold you in the fire as long as it takes. And I've run across that from time to time. You know, that's to be expected. I'd like to read you my favorite statement in Spirit of Prophecy. Volume 5 of the Testimony 740. We're going to end with this. All the paternal love which has come down from generation to generation through the channels of human hearts, all the springs of tenderness which have opened in the souls of men are as but a tiny reel to the boundless ocean when compared with the infinite, exhaustless love of God. Tongue cannot utter it. Pen cannot portray it. You may meditate upon it every day of your life. You may search the scriptures diligently in order to understand it. You may summon every power and capability that God has given you in the endeavor to comprehend the love and the compassion of the Heavenly Father. And yet there is an infinity beyond. You may study that love for ages, yet you can never fully comprehend the length and the breadth, the depth and the height of the love of God in giving His Son to die for the world. Eternity itself will never fully reveal it we're just scratching the surface here now if this is the last message to be given to the world we better understand this let's pray loving father we're so grateful that we've had this opportunity to share we pray that as we lifted up jesus we saw a love that will forever change us may your spirit attend each person here and may we continue to look higher and still higher towards that glorious throne and your Son, and that we can have face-to-face fellowship with you someday soon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.